Hello, I'm Elon Orbash. Welcome to my office. Uh, what I want to do today is introduce you to the GigaPan Epic Pro unit. We'll talk a little bit about the hardware and about some of the considerations of using uh, full-scale DSLR cameras with big zoom lenses on this uh, hardware. So first of all, here's a great example of the hardware. Um, it has a pan motor on the bottom. It's a stepper motor. It's uh, quite strong, so it can handle quite a bit of load. And then it has uh, two steppers on the sides, which it uses for tilt. It's very hard to move this by hand. You have to push and be patient. And then it has some adjustments for the nodal point so that you can get your camera to not have parallax. One is the fore aft adjustment here. And the other is there's a height adjustment here. The whole unit can go up and down. Also, the pro unit uh, demands an electronic shutter. So in fact, there's a set of cables that come with it with different types of connectors for all the various cameras on the market, uh, the DSLRs on the market, so that you can trigger the camera appropriately. Some people have also used it by having it move the panorama between positions, the camera between positions, and they've pressed the shutter button manually on their robot. That, of course, works too. Let me also tell you about the battery. The battery is a custom battery unit here on the side, and it's a nickel metal hydride battery pack. It's 4,300 milliamp hours, and it lasts uh, a large number of of gigapans. Typically, you can use it for anywhere from 5 to 15 complete gigapan panoramas. I'll put the battery pack back and explain one other thing about the battery that's important, which is the battery is charged in the unit. There's a charger dock uh, right here. And what's nice about that is you could actually plug this into the AC adapter that comes with the unit, and you can charge the battery while you're taking gigapans. And so you can have the charger plugged in, you can use the system, and it's like a laptop in the sense that it's charging when it can and it's using power when it can. So that covers the uh, fundamentals of the hardware. Let's run you through the menu screens and talk about what they do. You turn it on just by holding in the power button. And once we've done that, we go into the main menu. New panorama and 360 panorama are the settings you're going to use to take a panorama. New panorama will ask you to set the top left and bottom right corners of the panorama. 360 panorama asks you to set just the top and bottom edge and it takes it all the way around. Um, the other uh, option that I want to show you right away is move camera. Move camera is quite useful. Because this thing is so heavy, once you've got the DSLR on here and you're trying to adjust exposure and go to different parts of the scene, move camera is great because once you're in that mode, you can move around, you can look at the scene, you can figure out what the exposure reads in different positions, uh, how much the shallow depth of field you have matters or doesn't matter and such and then you can cancel out of that whenever you like. So move camera is a very, very useful way to just move your camera around and get a feel for the scene. Now, there's a few other menus, so I'm going to go back up to the top. We talked about new panorama and 360 panorama. Let's just run through options. So let's dive into options and just talk briefly about the various options in here. Time per pick. This is essentially the amount of time the camera, the robot is going to wait between pictures that it takes. This is set uh, by default to about 3 seconds, in this case 2.5 seconds out of the factory. And the reason to make this long is because, for example, the exposure is going to be quite long on the camera and you want plenty of time to deal with the exposure and deal with writing to the SD card before you take the next picture. So here you can adjust how long the robot takes between pictures. Start delay is also very useful. The idea here is, do you want to trigger the beginning of the panorama with an external trigger that you plug in on the bottom of the unit? so that the panorama begin, doesn't begin to be acquired until you want it to? Or do you want to introduce a delay, like let's say five minutes after you say go, you want it to begin taking the panorama so that you can run into the scene or so that an event can occur. So that's the start delay. Multiple shutter is where you can specify how many times you want the trigger to go off in each position of the panorama. Picture order allows you to specify whether you want column or row ordering of the pictures in the panorama, left to right, right to left, top to bottom, or bottom to top. Battery status is nice because it shows you the voltage of the system. 7.8 volts is great. Anything above 7 volts I consider quite good. I'm going to cancel out of that. And factory reset, of course, does exactly what it looks like. And we'll leave expert options as homework for the student at home. So those are options. Panorama memory allows you to call up the last panorama. This is very useful if you want to do time-lapse like work, take the same panorama over and over again. Or if you take a panorama and then something really neat happens, a lion comes and sits down in the middle of the bush. And what you want to do is go right back to that position in the panorama and shoot that particular picture again 
and integrate that into the panorama that you're about to stitch. So panorama memory makes it easy to do that. Camera setup is very important. What you do with camera setup is you set the field of view of your system. Now, that field of view, of course, determines the number of degrees that the GigaPan Pro should move between pictures. So there's two things that you set here. One thing that you set is the actual native field of view that your, your camera has at the zoom level that you've chosen to use. And so you have your camera on here, and you set it by physically moving the camera. And I'll show you how to do that once we mount the camera. The other thing that you set in camera setup is you can set the percent of overlap that you want. So do you want 30% overlap between pictures, or 40%, or 20%? OK, that is a description really briefly of some of the main menus on the GigaPan uh, Epic Pro. Now let's pull this aside and talk about a DSLR and some of the considerations when you're going to be doing some picture taking. Now, DSLRs are fantastic for GigaPanning because the image sensors are large. You're going to get very high quality images even in relatively low light conditions. And what I want to do is talk about the lens a little bit and then talk about the camera. I'm just going to give you, an, as an example, this is a, a Canon 5D Mark II and it has a 70 to 200 millimeter lens on it. So let's start with the lens. There are some issues that you'll have questions about. One of the biggest questions is always about autofocus versus manual focus. So should I use autofocus? Should I use manual focus? Well, the answer is it depends. Uh, in a situation where you can lock the focus with manual focus and really nail what you want, that's fantastic. And there's one important reason for that. When you trigger these cameras to take a picture, if you put them in autofocus mode, and they can't get any contrast and therefore can't focus, they'll often not take a picture. So you're going to miss a shot, and that's really bad. So what some of our members will do is they'll put the camera in manual focus for the sky, and they'll put it in, say, row mode. And for the sky, they'll nail it at infinity and take the pictures. And then when they get to the tree line or to the grass or to the crowd, they'll go to autofocus so that each picture gets to an optimum focus as chosen by the lens. And so that's fine, because you're simply going to pause, change the setting of the lens, and then resume and continue. Of course, the important thing is you want to make sure your white balance, your exposure, and those settings don't change in the middle of your panorama, because otherwise, when you stitch it together, you get some poor image results in often. The stabilizer is another question. Typically, we, rep we, we recommend leaving the stabilizer off. Um, now, this one has two modes of stabilization, mode one and mode two. Mode 1 is for normal vibrations and oscillations that you might get from, say, wind. And this is a very heavy camera on top of a heavy GigaPan Pro. You have to have a really strong tripod to make this whole system work well. And if you do have wind, you can, of course, try turning the stabilizer on and see if that helps with the wind situation. Um, it's worth a shot. If you're going to do that, you probably want to change the settings in the camera so that you're in live view mode so that the stabilizer is on continuously and warmed up. And then the camera is continuously warmed up and locked on. So that's a consideration if you're going to leave stabilization on. So those are the issues that I wanted you to be aware of on the lens. Um, of course, the lens is so heavy, we're going to connect the GigaPan uh, dongle to the lens rather than the camera. And then if we go to the camera body and just talk about some of the settings in here and what matters, we'll typically shoot in manual mode. We will typically fix the white balance. And so however you like to fix the white balance and nail it, whether it's a custom setting or one of the preordained settings, is fine. Um, live view mode, again, top left button, is often very useful because you're going to get a picture where you're seeing the sharpness of the image that you're about to take. And let's talk a little bit about ISO. Sensors are so large and they have such good signal-to-noise ratios. It's typically the case that you can go to rather large ISO values and still get great pictures. So don't be afraid to go to 400 and 800. Because you're on this large system on top of a tripod, things are moving. You've zoomed into 200 millimeters, so the smallest vibration is causing some blurring. You really want that shutter speed to be fast. And so it's all right to have a nice high ISO in order to make the shutter speed as fast as possible. You don't get much noise on these cameras until you go to really high ISO. And so that's quite all right. Let's also talk about the aperture. As you sit here using this camera adjusting the aperture, one of the challenges you'll have is, uh, should I make it uh, really, really small aperture or wide open? The issue is typically you're concerned about diffraction. And so typically what you're worried about is, if I make the aperture small, I'm going to get into a diffraction situation and I'm maximizing my sharpness at some point well below the smallest iris that's possible. 
And that's true, so that's one reason to shy away from the smallest aperture possible. But depth of field is a big deal. And depth of field is a real challenge with gigapanning with a large throw lens. Because you're going to be zooming in because you can. And that way you get this fabulous resolution. You can see trees in a forest at sub-millimeter resolution on the bark. But when you do that and you zoom in all the way, you get very shallow depth of field. And so first of all, you've got to have autofocus on in a situation like that, or you need things to be more or less planar, or you need to have a very small iris. But if you have a very small iris, then you've got this problem of diffraction. And suddenly the picture is softer than you intended, and you've lost some of that, that sharp focused uh, detail that you were interested in. So that's the trade-off, and it's worth experimenting with that trade-off to try and achieve the best results possible. Again, middle of the road is what matters. Often you don't zoom in all the way. Uh, of course, remember when you do that to set the field of view again on the Gigapan Epic Pro so that it knows how many degrees to move per picture. And often uh, you're going to go for something in the middle where the ISO is uh, larger and allows you to have a smaller iris and still not have a, a super long shutter speed. That's the key things that I want to cover in order to give you an idea of those general settings. Now let me go through a few other settings, but before I do that, on the menu side, I want to show you how to mount the camera. So mounting this camera on top of the Epic Pro in involves first attaching the connector uh, that's designed for the Gigapan unit, and then we'll bring in the Pro, and we'll simply use the quick release to actually mount it in. Typically, of course, I'm doing this on top of a tripod. I'm going to do it on a table right now instead, just so that I have the ability to uh, show it to you without need of a tripod, and we can lock it if we like. So now we've got our unit on top. Now, to deal with the nodal point issues, what we would be doing is we would be adjusting up down from these screws on the sides, and then we would be adjusting this fore aft for the nodal point fore aft. And of course, in the fore aft direction for the nodal point, it depends on the zoom. So as you zoom in, the nodal point is going to move back. And as you zoom out, the nodal point is going to move forward in the lens system. So that's the key issues that you're going to deal with. In this case, with this Canon, uh, this is the correct cable that we use, and I'm going to go ahead and plug in the cable into the uh, unit just so that I can do one quick panorama with you to give you an idea of what it looks like when you're actually using it. So now we'll end by just doing one very quick panorama in here and going through all the control setup for that. I'm going to turn the camera on first. And I've got my camera on. The lens cap is off. That's good. I'm going to go ahead and adjust my... Uh, my um, exposure, and I'm going to have a nice open aperture in this case until I'm happy with uh, how things look. There we go. I'm going to take a test picture. I'm going to go to manual focus in this case. Good. So now I'm happy that I'm getting good pictures out of the system. Uh, you can't see it, but trust me. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn the Gigapan Epic Pro on and show you the process that I'd go on from here. I've got the trigger in, the remote trigger in. So I'm happy with my pictures. I'm in manual mode. I'll go ahead and turn on this system. And once this is on, I'm going to choose New Panorama. Set camera zoom and hit OK when you're done. I am done, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, hit OK. And I'm going to move the camera to the upper left. In this case, I'm just going to take a silly picture of my bookcase. So here's my bookcase. This means that at home, I'll be able to review all the books on my bookcase. Always a useful thing. There we go. So there's a 9x9 nine nine, uh, picture. Gigapan epic shot. Show panorama? No. Let's go ahead and take the pictures. So it's going to take 81 pictures. And I'll hit OK. And in gory detail, I'm going to have the bindings of uh, about 40 books in very, very extreme detail. There's a checklist that comes on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and click through the checklist. It's making sure that my white balance is locked, and my exposure is locked, and my focus is locked. And in this case, it is. I did the focus by hand. I'm putting my hand here because I don't want this thing to fall over since it's on a table rather than on a tripod. And indeed, it's taking pictures, and it's taking it through the remote trigger. Now, we're not going to wait for 81 pictures to get taken, so I'm going to pause it. So just to review, the most important things for you to worry about are Get the nodal point uh, aligned appropriately, especially if you're taking pictures where you have objects at varying distances so that parallax is an issue. 
make sure that as much as possible you can deal with the trade-off between shallow depth of field and the iris size and diffraction and vignetting. So large iris, you're going to have some vignetting. So you want to keep it smaller than the largest opening for that reason. But small iris, you're going to have diffraction. And be sure to adjust time per picture on the Epic Pro and the shutter method so that you're getting the best possible pictures you can in the ordering that makes it all work well. Good luck.